This video lecture will cover chapter two for FERS psychometrics on scaling. So scaling is a part of measurement that involves the building of an instrument that links quali qualitative constructs with quantitative metric units. Scaling is developed out of those efforts in psychology and education to be able to measure those unmeasurable constructs like confidence or self-esteem. And it involves describing a method to operationally scoring the test, that is creating an underlying scale on which people traits are going to be measured. It also refers to converting those scores uh, in order to be able to report the results, specifically those conversions that are designed to be able to carry detailed information that's regarding a particular characteristic. So we know that psychological measurement is a process in which numbers are assigned to represent the quantities of psychological characteristics. In order for the measurement process to succeed, the stats assigned to a characteristic has to reflect the actual amounts of that trait. So measurement is the assignment of numerals to objects or events according to the rules that's been put, created. Scaling is important because it helps to define measurement. It allows us to be able to differentiate how the numerical values applies within an assessment. Understanding these differences provides important inferences of how we use and understand the test and also how it greatly depends on how we use the scales of measurement. So in terms of fundamental issues with numbers, Galton, he first defined psychometrics as the art of imposing measurement in a number upon operations of the mind, which has been a guide for us in psychology <clears throat> toward the development and appraisal of those clinical, educational, and psychological tests. In the assessment process, numbers represent a person's psychological characteristic or trait that we know. It allows us to be able to access the trait in different ways, and it's dependent on the disposition of the numbers assigned. There are three important numerical properties that we have to consider, that being property of identity, property of order, and property of quantity. However, we need to also keep in mind that we must first understand the meaning of zero. Basically, the numerical properties of one's identity, the order, and the quantity would be reflected by the, how the numerals would represent potential differences in psychological attributes. Moreover, you must consider zero to be a complex number, and this complexity will have different kinds of meanings within test scores. So a score of zero can have an enormous different meaning in various measurement frameworks. Starting with property of identity, the most important type of measurement is the ability to show sameness versus differentness. The first rule would be to establish a category. The participants within the category must satisfy the property of identity. One example, which you'll be able to find uh, the entire article uh, on Canvas in the module sections under Media Resources, uh, is Matthews and Company. They conducted a study on student health professionals to determine psychometrically their professional identity. Here, the category involved was the professional identity. The study aimed to identify professional identity measures that would be used with university students that's enrolled in health programs and produced evidence of the psychometric properties. The review was conducted in two phases. First phase involved a search for several different databases online that would um, use professional identity measures with student health professionals. In the second phase, it involved searching the same databases for psychometric evidence of the measures that was identified in phase one. Now, what that did was to allow them to help to determine the sameness of their participants in the category. The study allowed the researchers to then explore the effect of differences in the development process based on the participants' perspectives. So, all people within a category must be identical with respect to the features reflected by the category, and the categories must be mutually exclusive. 
meaning that the participants, as discussed in the article, must have to be in a health profession, okay? <clears throat> Additionally, the categories must be exhaustive. If you found that a participant were in two fields, for example, in the article or in the study, then you would need to create a whole different category as the study was looking specifically at student health professionals. When making categorical differentiations between people, those distinctions between the members of the different categories represent differences in the type rather than differences in quantity. So again, looking back at the study, the researchers' classifications of the study of student health professionals which show the difference between the development process based on the student perspectives. In this example, the classification is not intended to represent the amount of differences, but rather the presence of variations of the developmental process. Classification is going to be intended to represent the qualitative distinct groups of the development. When discussing the property or order, here we're looking um, to provide more information in the assessment. Remember, with the property of identity, the numerals allowed us to classify the traits involved. Whereas in the property of order, we now are looking at the amount of the attribute that's in a, um, that a participant may possess. It indicates a rank order of the group along a continuum or a dimension. So when numbers are used in ranking, it represents a labeling process. So returning back to that article, for example, the property of order helped the researchers to rank different aspects of the development of a professional identity, that being with health professions like university affiliation, health settings that was involved for the teaching process, the roles the student played within those clinical settings and so forth. Although the property of order provides more information than the property of identity, ultimately it's still limited. Uh, though it gives a relative amount of the differences between the participants, it's still going to lack the actual degree of the difference in that trait or, or a particular characteristic. The property of order is still an indefinite way of being able to demonstrate those psychological differences. Now the third issue, property of quantity, provides information about the magnitude about the differences between people. Basically the value of a number defines the size of a basic unit within a scale. The units of the measurement are standardized quantities, that being the size of a unit is determined by some type of convention. And here we kind of know that real numbers are considered to be continuous. We're able to manipulate them by compartmentalizing the data into infinitely smaller parts. So in terms of measurement, real numbers are often referred to as the scalar, metric, cardinal, or quantitative values. And the power of real numbers allows us to be able to measure the quantity of a trait of a situation or of a person. So when we're assessing an attribute correctly, the real numbers are going to be indicative to the amount of that behavior. So we use psychological tests to measure psychological attributes and often it allows us to assume that the test scores will have the property of quantity. But we need to be able to understand that this is not going to always be a reasonable assumption. So let's talk about the number zero. There's two possible meanings when we speak about zero. It may represent uh, something that does not even exist in a situation or a per person. And this would be called, you know, particularly an absolute zero, meaning it doesn't exist. But then you have <clears throat> where there's attributes that's dealing with time or duration of a behavior. Um, or you can also look at temperature as an example of what we call an arbitrary zero. So we know that most traits, they're not going to possess an absolute zero. But there are some psychological instruments that helps to present it with the score of zero. So there's a particular behavior that may not be present itself, 
but can have a potential of being present, which would make it arbitrary. This is when we use like z-scores that would allow us to have that mean of distribution, which would always be zero. And in this situation, it can represent either arbitrary or relative zero. So with that being said, when we're talking about fundamental issues with numbers, is allowing us to understand the psychological test scores. We know that there are those three properties of numerals, and then we also know the fundamental issues that will revolve around zero. Okay. So when we talk about units of measurement, or we can also call it standard measures, we know that these are generally formulated arbitrarily. And they're expressed based upon what the psychological construct would be attempted to measure. Based on arbitrary units of measure, there's maybe three ways that's utilized that can take on a physical form. And when we're speaking about physical measurement, Standard units would include units like pounds, liters, milliseconds, and the fact that they're expressed arbitrarily gives them the flexibility in being generalized. But when we're looking at psychological attributes, we kind of understand that the unit of measurement was stems from those arbitrary contexts. Each instrument will have a determined unit or point uh, than the next one. So in this chapter, when we're talking about scaling and such, we have discussed the physicality or of the standard measure. But in psychometrics, we kind of look at many variables that will be able to, that we can be able to measure. And these can include things like sex, age, height, weight, birth order. We often can tell whether someone might be a male or female by just looking at them. And you might ask, uh, <clears throat> your participants uh, who you're assessing about their age, how old they are, and hopefully they'll tell you exactly their age. But they might also have people who don't want to tell you anything. Um, they might not want to share how much they weigh, for example, and you might have to uh, ask them to do something more direct like getting on a scale. These are things that we have to work through when we're talking about psychological testing. And generally speaking, in this field, in psychometrics, probably the majority, we're not going to always have the straightforward or simple things to measure. We're not going to be able to accurately always assess people's level of intelligence just by looking at them. That's why we have instruments that would allow us and help us. Because we certainly can't pull the self-esteem um, from a person by using, if we're talking about their weight, by using a scale. The scale is not going to tell us how they feel about their body um, based upon their level of weight. So these are variables um, that would be constructs. It includes all different types of traits. It can be personality traits. It can be one's emotional state. We could talk about attitudes about one's culture, um, if there's competitiveness, if they're athletics. I mean, the list can go on. Psychological constructs that would not be easily or directly observed are some of the reasons that we tend to work within units of measurements, which again is arbitrary, because we kind of try to create that line of what we are looking for. And one reason that uh, is often represented tends to be how one might think or feel or act in particular ways. So an example can be that, um, say, for example, we're using the university student and then we're looking about extroversion or introversion. And the person might share that they're extroverted, but doesn't mean that he or she is acting extroverted, extroverted in a particular time of the interview. They might actually act more introverted. So what you want to be able to say is be able to take time to look at by asking specific questions that would allow you to be able to measure the amount of extroversion. So in this case, we're talking about the big five personality traits. 
which can give us a lot of information about extroversion, introversion. Okay, so just remember in terms of this, when we're speaking about it right now, remember that units of measurement, it's more or less, um, we're looking at the physical uh, constructs of things that we can directly observe, that being length, the count of inches. But when we're talking about it in terms of psychology, now we're looking at how we would have to construct based upon the variables we're looking at. So if we're looking at one's level of emotions, then one test might have uh, the information, but it wouldn't go across the board for all and any of the psychological tests that can be used. So from learning a little bit about units of measurements, you now have to have an understanding about additivity as well as counting. And counting I'll talk about in a second. But here, additivity, we're talking about how we're measuring something with the, within the units of measurement and how it can be arbitrary, okay? And those units, they have to have some type of meaning to it. And within psychology, those meanings have to have a, a identical stance, okay? Be that within IQ testing, if we're looking at the different levels, they have to be similar, the same um, in terms of levels. But <clears throat> the assumption is that the unit size, it's not going to change. That all units of being counted are going to be identical. So in other words, we're talking about additivity requires a unit size to remain constant. That unit increase at one point in the measurement process has to be the same as a unit increase at any other point. Okay, so you think about the different scales, it has to have those starting points. Additionally, when we're talking about size of measurement, <clears throat> the unit shouldn't have change in conditions for the measurement to change. So pretty much what we want to make sure we're measuring is going to be affected by only one attribute of the thing that we're trying to measure. So regardless of the conditions that might exist at the time or place of measurement. So think about when you're doing uh, intelligence testing, you know, we talk about how there's importance of trying to maintain the same type of format throughout the testing experience, being the environment of the room, you want to have it in that place. If it's going to be a time lapse type of um, scales that you're working with, you want to make sure that you're following the directions exactly each and every time so that <clears throat> the additivity is and your measurements is going to be accurate and considered reliable. So pretty much what I'm speaking about is a condition that's known as a conjoint additive measurement. So back in 1931, Thurston, he kind of constructed what we call the rash model of unit, ma um, unit <clears throat> that maintains the process, which allowed for additivity in the first place. And pretty much what it did was provide a basis for fundamental measurement. Uh, a researcher named Wright, back in 1985, he talked about this additivity uh, measurement within unit of measurement and how it can be constructed for psychological research and traced all the way back to Luce and um, Tukey back in 1964. So what they demonstrated and showed was that a conjoint additivity would be good for measuring uh, things that's produced by physical connotations and that can be obtained through responses that's produced by the interactions of like two objects, that being the person you're testing and the test items you're providing. So pretty much the only thing that was necessary would be that interaction that's conducted um, and how it has to be equal in order to get the outcomes that's going to be expected. So when we're talking about counting, <clears throat> we have to realize that not all forms of counting would qualify as measurement. And we count things, objects, rather than counting attributes. 
you know, we might count, for example, the number of seats that we could find in the clinic. But would you count self-esteem in a person in the same manner? Fur talks about how <clears throat> there's been a controversy um, and different uh, theorists have argued about simply counting numbers of some kind of object wouldn't really qualify as a measurement. And they continued in the um, debate as far as talking about counting would qualify as a measurement only when one is counting to reflect the amount of some feature of an attribute or of the um, object itself. So Ferg gave the example about a physical scientist using <clears throat> a Geiger counter to count radioactive emissions from an object and that he or she measured the radioactivity of the object. And then similarly, it was the professor, say me, for example, I counted the number of correct answers that was given by uh, a student on a multiple choice examination, then he or she might be measuring the amount of the content of the material, in this case, let's say introductory to psychology, how much information they was able to know. Um, but would that have provided me, if just saying the number of right answers, is it going to provide me with how much material did the student actually ascertain? that would be the measurement that I would be actually looking for. So that's going to be that psychological attribute, the level of intelligence, the competence that I would be wanting to measure instead. So that talks about what counting is all about. So just as a recap and talking about scaling and the different levels of measurements, we know that the scaling provides us with four levels of measurements. And this slide, it gives give you a graphic to kind of help you to put into your mind and give you a refresher of what each would represent. So on <clears throat> the side here, we know we have the principles and properties of identity, order, quantity, and absolute zero. And the levels of measurements, when we're talking about nominal, you know we're talking about the different categories that will be involved. When we speak about ordinal, remember that's the order of the, <clears throat> of the measure. Intervals are going to be representing the arbitrary zero, and then ratio would represent the absolute zero. And they use the examples of biological sex that uh, demonstrates that nominal, the category. The rank, class rank demonstrates with both identity as well as um, order. You can see that. Uh, ordinal would be able to label. And then we have with interval, we, we're looking at identity of, the order of, and the quantity or the amounts of, and then ratio would give us all of that, including the absolute zero. And in the example they're using is talking about distance. We were able to identify what we're looking at, say the distance between one mile and provide the order of, it could be with the interval of the increments, it could be the quantity of looking at the one mile, and then of course we start from zero and go to one mile. So to wrap this up, of course we see that um, talking about scaling, it has this, it, it has this usefulness and knowing and understanding the meaning for it to know how it allows us to prepare our instruments with descriptive and that's talking about again being able to categorize and be able to provide those labels and it provides us with being able to create a parametric, uh, parametric excuse me, statistics in terms of talking about the ordinal, the interval, and the ratio. So some arguments are is it really necessary to be able to do all that some would say yes, and there are those who felt that it's just making things more complicated than it has to be. So this wraps up chapter two of scaling, uh, and I'll see you in the next video.